Good day again, everyone. Say it with me, the journey to Calvary. The journey to Calvary. And what a journey it was. Now, a lot of times we might ask ourselves, what exactly is the journey to Calvary? And a lot of us would answer and say, well, obviously, it's everything leading up to the death of Jesus on the cross. And then I might ask you a question and say, well, when did this journey begin? And you might say, well, it began when Judas betrayed him. And when they locked him up, arrested him, tried him with the most unjust of trials. And then sentence him to death and put him on the cross. Or some of you may say it's when his ministry began. When John the Baptist baptized him in the river Jordan. Or some of you may even go as far as say, well, it's the moment he took on flesh and dwelt among us. When he came in John chapter 1 verse 1. When the word dwelt among us. And we beheld the glory of the Father. But I want to tell you that the journey to Calvary began a long, long time ago. Even longer than we sometimes realize. Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 tells us that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of, of the world. Now this confirms what was said also in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. I could imagine how Adam and Eve felt, how, how, how distressed and and turmoil and heavy they felt after realizing that this, they disappointed God tremendously. But God in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, he highlighted a prophecy. And we see it as the first recorded, recorded prophecy in history. The first prophetic word spoken. Where the Lord God, even though he was very disappointed with Adam and Eve. He watched the serpent and he spoke to the serpent and he said, the woman will bear a seed. And that seed, even though, even though the serpent might bruise his heel, that seed was going to crush the head of the serpent. And that is exactly where we could see the journey to Calvary beginning. Because the scripture said in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 that Jesus Christ was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So really and truly we saw a mechanism in place that God, even when he made us in his image and likeness, Put in his effort. As a matter of fact, he didn't even speak us into being. All other things, mountains, planets, galaxies, the wind, the sea, whales, even your baby, even your puppy you have home. <laughs> he spoke them into being. But for us, he soiled his hands. For us, he took up soil and he said, let us make man in our image and likeness. And he made man in image and likeness and he breathed the breath of life into man. And man became a living soul. That's the kind of effort God put into you just so that you could exist. And God knew exactly. God knew that at some point in time, the perfect creation he made was going to slip up. So, but guess what? He had a contingency plan in place. So that as soon as he addressed his open, he told him of somebody who's going to come and crush his head. And so the journey of Calvary began. And this journey, it continued through the lives of men like Seth. Men like Methuselah, men like Noah who built the ark. And it led right up to a man named Abraham who God orchestrated a divine plan. So that through Abraham and Sarah, there was going to come a people who would be set apart for God. A people who would reveal his glory in a mighty and a powerful way. This people would be a representation of him. A true and proper representation of him to the world. It sounds familiar? That kind of people sound familiar? Amen. This journey, the journey to Calvary, it saw a man named Moses, an Israelite who grew up as an Egyptian king. And an Israelite who knew of the false god of Egypt. God walked through Moses to make a mockery of the false gods of Egypt and to proclaim the almighty God. He made a mockery. The Egyptians worshipped the God of denial and the God of the sun and the God of all of these things. And God's hand was extended to all those elements and said, let me show you who is the boss. As we were preparing for the journey to Calvary. This journey saw the rise of a great king, King David, the son of Jesse, who became king of Israel and the covenant recipient of the promise of the very said lamb in Revelation and the serpent that was going to get crushed head. The, 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 the person was going to crush that serpent's head. 
this person, this mysterious individual was going to come through the line of David. The journey to Calvary saw prophets, priests, and kings proclaim the coming of the line of Judah and the Lamb of God. The lion and the lamb himself came in total humility yet absolute power. Because he came and even his own didn't receive him. You could imagine that? His own didn't receive him. But to as many as believe on him, to them gave he to become who? Even to them that believe on his name. Wow, people who are not born of the will of man, nor of flesh, nor of blood, but who are born of the spirit of God. A totally new transformation, the greatest of miracles. Jesus taught with his divine wisdom, and he helped others to learn. As a matter of fact, he helped mere men. He didn't look for kings and queens and princes and doctors and lawyers. He grabbed fishermen and laymen, tax collectors who nobody liked, people who people looked down upon or who people saw as not being important. He grabbed those men, and he taught them, and he empowered them, and those men by some amazing miracle, a.k.a. by the power of Jesus Christ, they became some of the most impactful humans who ever walked the face of this earth. Unlearned men, unassuming men, but today we know of their names, we know of their story, we know of their impact, because what was done by Jesus Christ while he was on this journey to Calvary. His three and a half year ministry of teaching, discipleship, and miracles. It ended with a week, a week that we are observing now, that culminated in the greatest event in human history. The week started with a Sunday where a whole bunch of people were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to the son of David. And they gave and they threw at his feet all kind of palms. They threw palms at his feet, they took their robes and they threw it at his feet so that him, and when he was on the donkey's colt, it could have walked on it because they saw him as royalty. But then things started to turn around in that same week. Because it looked like the week was going to begin on a high note. And it was going to go on a high note. But not exactly so. Because on Monday, he found himself in the temple and he had to chase out a bunch of people. He said, all of you are making my father's house a prayer into a den of thieves. He had to chase them out. On Tuesday, they attempted an ambush on his life. They said, we need to get rid of this man once and for all. But they were not prosperous in that endeavor. On Wednesday, he decided to go and rest by some friends of his in Bethany, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But while he and his disciples went to rest in Bethany, Judas started planning his schemes against him. By Thursday, he had a dinner with the very person even the very person who betrayed him was in his presence. But he still had dinner with him, imagine that. And he still broke bread and drank wine with him. And he went in to get some money. And he bled for us. And when I say bled, you're probably saying, but Pastor Chad, he ain't reached on the cross yet. Well, remember the scripture says that he prayed so hard, his sweat was like drops of... You ever pray so hard? You ever felt that pressure? Because as I was telling the church last Sunday, you can't survive that pressure. That's why you couldn't die for your own sins. You couldn't die for your own sins. And then Friday, Judas, with his bold face dirtiness, he come to Christ and he go and kiss him on his cheek and he say, Hail Rabbi. Oh my gosh. Judas, he said, that's how you would do this on a man? And of all ways to betray the son of man, you do it with a kiss. Wow. That is the definition of messed up. Wow. And then they locked him up and they had a, the most unjust of trials. They carried him in the wee hours of the morning and they had fake witnesses against him. And they had all of these accusations and he did not say a thing to defend himself because he knew it was his time. And by Friday around this time, he was dead on the cross. He had already said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The journey to Calvary might confuse you. It might seem perplexing. Or it might seem like foolishness to some. Because you might say, why would God allow such a thing to happen? Why would God make himself susceptible to the enemy's plans? I'm sure even the enemy was probably wondering, I wonder if God sure to come in human form and dwell amongst men. But one thing we understand is that the good journey to Calvary, it culminated with us once again, having the ability and the hope 
of observing the beauty of Eden. You're probably saying, Pastor Chad, what do you mean? The beauty of Eden is us having eternal life. The beauty of Eden is of walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. The beauty of Eden is us experiencing what it means to have sonship in Christ, to be children of God. Are you children of God today? And the beauty of Eden is to experience true rest in him. This was possible because the journey to Calvary did not stop with the cross. The journey to Calvary did not stop with death. It didn't stop with the grave. But instead, the journey truly ended with the cross, death, and grave being overcome. God bless you all.